to KGB Monday Night Poetry. Um, my mind has blanked on the stats. John, can you uh, can you fill me in on those? I think we're looking at year uh, 24, season 47, episode 5? Five. 5, yes. That was the one thing that I was positive of. So tonight, thank you, John. So uh, tonight we have two of the finest poets at work in our language. Uh, together, they count for two of the three American poets going, Robert Hass being the third, whose books I order in hardcover at full price when they come out. Uh, each is a poet whose poems, um, especially when you experience them across volumes, uh, have a way of popping the hood on poetry and making a reader conscious, not of trends in poetry, but of eternal sort of qualities and tensions in any poem. Some clocks just show you the time and other clocks show you behind a glass door, a pendulum and a translation of perpetual motion into the units we newfangled humans organize our days in. In Vijay's poems, you can become freshly and startlingly conscious of the relationships between the sentence and the line and the sentence and the poem. In one point in his 1589 Art of Posey, George Putnam sets up a journeying on horseback conceit while he's talking about rests in poetry. He compares the comma to stopping for a pint, a colon to stopping for a meal, and a period, a periodus, to stopping for the night. In that conceit, a sentence is a very long thing, a full day journey on a horse. I tend to think of the sentence as a walk to the mailbox, and then the walk back, that's another sentence. But it's a convention that makes me think that. Anyhow, the consciousness that any sentence is theoretically possible of extending to an infinite length, and that assertion or even a feeling infinitely refinable by that impulse to greater clarity that makes us say, but, although, which, in that, much like all these things we do that make our sentences longer, that is a unique feature of Sishadri's maker's mind. What's interesting is that the awareness doesn't only apply itself to sentences that are long. He can fashion a very dry humorous tone by putting a sentence by itself on a line, which he does a good bit of in, in That Was Now, This Is Then, um, his new book, which I'm happy not to be holding backwards. He can also use sentence lengths within a single poem to dramatize very different degrees of self-control or a feeling of self-control he does in the poem soliloquy. Um, anyway, it's in his many styles of sentence that Fishadri is, it's because of his many styles of sentence that Fishadri is able to write, that Vijay Sashadri is able to write short, mid-length, longish, long, and extra long poems. Um, among the American poets I've read, and I haven't read them all, only Robert Frost runs the whole route tree of lengths like Vijay Sashadri. Um, and, uh, I'm now gonna talk about the poet that I'm introducing. Uh, in, the, in the case of Henri Cole, our first reader tonight, I'm not sure that there's any poet whose work can better show us how to craft a tempo that is slower than the four syllables per second that most of us talk in and imagine speech in. I also don't know of a poet whose work can show us how subtle typographic features can have an almost ecological effect on the whole of a poem and the way a poem plays in the audio player of a reader's mind. The first poem, the first volume of poems of Henri's I read was Middle Earth. I had arrived at a residency right after he left and his volumes were still displayed in the library. I grabbed them all selfishly and uh, took them to my hut and uh, you know, began to cookie monster them. Um, the, the poems in the book Middle Earth spoke on the page in a voice that was softer and slower than any voice that words on a page had caused to play in my mind. Uh, James Wright, uh, an Ohioan, um, is the only other poet close. Um, in such a tone and at such a tempo, a representation of teeth being brushed can become a sensuous and holy instance of our being alive. Uh, the poems, as fans of Henri's know, employ that full line of space between every line. Uh, one line stands as is another way that people think of that. Um, so I immediately after you know, reading these poems went and tried banging some space between the lines in my own poems. 
and uh, it didn't work at all. And uh, then I actually re tried retyping some uh, single stanza poems of Henri's from early, earlier books and trying to put spaces between those lines. And, uh, you know, the, the poems were better as they were. And that's really when the skylight opened. Um, everything in those double space poems of Henri's was working to cr together to create that sensation. The, the mise-en-scene, the, the, the tone of the nouns that he chooses, the nature of the dramatic situations that he puts his speakers in, um, a mindset of quiet looking that a lot of the poems begin in that can then proceed to becoming tactile. Um, Cole's new book, Blizzard, um, does not use the double space, but neither has the printer piled the lines on top of each other like pieces of salami that visually must be unpeeled off each other. Nicely done, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. The, the closer lines cohere to each other uh, to a slightly greater degree, though, and invite a slightly different approach. Um, there are thing poems in this book of the sort that Heaney wrote so well, poems organized around a single subject, uh, ode-like poems to a snail, mushrooms, a bat. Um, and he tends to write these in just the most unnoticeable blank verse you've ever felt yourself in. Um, there is uh, Basho all through this book. Um, I've already said too much and there's still more. Um, I will just say that the, the face of the bee, the poem that this book opens is, is a poem that can teach us just about everything and that no cinematographer can pull focus so fast and zoom in so close as a great poet. If we think of those grains of sand, gray, white, black, and red mixed with quartz grains, rose, and amethyst that Bishop wrote, um, we can begin to appreciate this, the face of this bee and the fact that a poem is a space that can give it a canvas to itself in the mind, even separate from the bee. Um, the book contains much of what we love about Cole, um, his incredible vegetable world similes, like my pride was like a giant oblong pumpkin. Um, his name is Henri Cole. He's won every award they've invented. Um, let's uh, give him a big round of applause. <laughs> and welcome him to KGB Monday Night Poetry Zoom. Thank you, Matthew. My goodness, my goodness, thank you. Um, you know, as I age, I think one of my biggest fears is becoming, I don't know, irrelevant to the generations behind me. So it's, I'm especially grateful to be invited by you and, and um, to be introduced by you. So uh, I think I'll begin uh, uh, with this poem that was included in the email. Um, um, that poem called Twilight is set up in the Adirondacks where for a, num a number of summers, um, I was, uh, I, I was there writing and I wrote really all the poems, almost all the poems in this book, Blackbird and Wolf of Mine. And the poem describes an encounter um, with a black bear and it, 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 it has a little flashback sequence in it. And then it comes back to the present. Um, Twilight. There's a black bear in the apple tree and he won't come down. I can hear him panting like an athlete. I can smell the stink of his body. Come down, black bear. Can you hear me? The mind is the most interesting thing to me. Like the sudden death of the sun, it seems implausible that darkness will swallow it, or that anything is lost forever there. Like a black bear in a fruit tree, gulping up sour apples with dry sucking sounds. Or like us at the pier, somber and tired, making food from sunlight. You saying a word, me saying a word, trying hard, though things were disintegrating. Still, I wanted you, your lips on my neck, your postmodern sexuality. Forlorn 
and anonymous. I didn't want to be that. I could hear the great barking monsters of the lower waters calling me forward. You see, my mind takes me far, but my heart dreams of return. Black bear with pale pink tongue at the center of his face is turning his head like the face of Christ from life. Shaking the apple boughs, he is stronger than I am and seems so free of passion. No fear, no pain, no tenderness. I want to be that. Come down, black bear. I want to learn the faith of the indifferent. Uh, the rest of the poems I'll read or, are from this book, Blizzard, which came out in September. Um, I think I'll read, try and read some poems I haven't read from it yet. Um, let's see, Matthew me mentioned this poem to a snail. In many of my poems, the mind engages with an animal um, or a plant or something in nature um, and then strives to move forward toward uh, some fresh idea as in this case. Um, to a snail. Like flesh or consciousness inhabited by flesh Willful, bold, tres chic. The skin on your gelid body is brownish from age and secretes viscid slime from your flat muscular foot. Like script, as if Agnes Martin had wed Caravaggio and then after rainfall, you ran away crossing a wet road with fiats rushing past where is your partner? Contemplating your tentacles in house, gliding on a trace of mucus from some dark stone to who knows where. Why do I feel happiness? It's a long game, the whole undignified, insane attempt at living. So I've relocated you to the woods. This poem is called Haiku. Um, it's not a haiku. It's a sort of sonnet length poem that ends with a haiku. Well, it's not really even a haiku. It's like a minimum haiku. It's three, three syllables, five syllables, three syllables rather than the five, seven, five. Um, it's a poem that has uh, more ethical concern than personal. Uh, well, you really can't separate the two. Haiku. After the sewage flowed into the sea and took the oxygen away, the fishes fled, but the jellies didn't mind. They stayed and ate up the food the fishes left behind. I sat on the beach in my red pajamas and listened to the sparkling foam, like feelings being fustigated. Nearby, a crayfish tugged on a string. In the distance, a man waved. Unnatural cycles seemed to be establishing themselves without regard to our lives. Deep inside, 
I could feel a needle skip. Autumn dark, murmur of the saw, poor humans. Well, I was thinking maybe I would read that Goya poem that Forrest mentioned. Um, I don't want to put pressure on Vijay, but uh, Goya. This is looking at one particular Goya print. I've tried to buy it at auction two or three times and I never I never have enough money to buy it, but so I wrote a poem about it instead. Um, three corpses bound to a tree stump, castrated, one without arms, its head impaled on, on a branch, a dark impression richly inked with a delicate burnishing of figures. Pondering it, I feel like a worm worming. If I want the truth, I must seek it out. The line between the inner and outer erodes and I become a hunter putting my face down somewhere on a path between two ways of being. One kindly and soft, the other an executioner. Later, out in the plaza, I light a cigarette and have a long pull with small exhales, taking the measure of my own hand, its lustrous, hairy knuckles dinged from grinding meat. I think I'll read these uh, two sonnet length. Many of these poems are sonnet lengths. It only takes a minute to read a sonnet uh, to my students who are thinking of signing up for that three minute, uh, three minute each reading and thinking three minutes isn't enough. Uh, a sonnet only takes a minute, uh, about a minute and a half if you're really patient with the words. Um, Let's see, this poem is called Corpse Pose. Um, I know people have strong preferences for cats versus dogs. So I guess this is kind of a trigger warning that this is a cat poem if you happen to be a dog person. <laughs> so um, Corpse Pose. Waiting for a deceased friend's cat to die is almost unbearable. This is where you live now, I explain. Please stop crying. But he is like a widower in some kind of holding pattern around a difficult truth. His head, his bearing, his movements are handsome to me a kind of permanent elsewhere devoted to separation and death. Please, let's try to forget, dear, we need each other. I feel I want to tell him something, but I'm not sure what. So much about life doesn't make sense. Each night I do the corpse pose and he ponders me with his corpse face licking his coat. The Egyptians first tamed his kind. Their dead were buried in galleries, closed up with stone slabs. When my friend and I were young, we tramped through woods of black oaks.
This is a poem called Man and Kitten. I think I was thinking of uh, remembering when I wrote that title, I was remembering a, a Mark Strand poem called Man and Camel. Uh, Mark Strand was one of my teachers when I was uh, in graduate school. Man and Kitten. It is such a curiously pleasant thing to hold the tenseness of a kitten, barefooted and subordinate, with soft, assertive tongue. Teaching it what I know, I think it loves me. A man is very nearly a god. A kitten, nothing. A man is self-praising, answering to nobody. A kitten chooses slavery over hunger. Tonight, mushrooms and bean curd with lemon sauce. A kitten will eat anything. Its life is mine now. It seems to like this. It doesn't know my phone doesn't ring. It doesn't know it reveals my life in a new light, even secured by a string. Suddenly there is trance, illumination, spectacle. Maybe I'll read just one more. I'll read the last poem in my book. Um, And I want to say again, it's just a real honor and a pleasure to read with VJ. I look forward to hearing his reading if I don't get a chance to say that again. <clears throat> and it makes me so happy to see all these names um, of friends from really across 30, 30 years and, and to see my students of this semester as well. Thank you all for coming. This poem is called Gay Bingo at a Pasadena animal shelter. My bingo cards are empty because I'm not paying attention. I can't hear the numbers because something inward is being given substance. Then my mother and father appear in the bingo hall and seem sad and solitary. They are shades now with pale skin and have no shame showing their genitals. This is before I am born and before a little strip of DNA mutated in the thirties and forties, part chimpanzee overran the community and before the friends of my youth are victims of discrimination. I resemble my mother and father, but if you look closer, you will see that I am different. I am Henri. Don't pay no mind to the haters, mother and father are repeating. And I listen poignantly, not hearing the bingo numbers called, I think maybe my real subject is writing as an act of revenge against the past. The beach was so white. Oh, how the sun burned. He loved me as I loved him, but we did what others told us and kept this hidden. Now I make my own decisions. I don't speak so softly. Tonight we're raising money for the shelter animals. The person I call myself, elegant, libidinous, austere, is older than many buildings here where time moves too swiftly, taking the measure of my body like hot sand or a hand leaving its mark and the bright sunlight blurs the days 
into one another. Still, the sleeping heart awakens and pricked and fed, it grows plump again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'm letting everyone unmute yourselves. If you want to clap, you can. Oh, thank you. Unmute yeah, let's yourselves do, let's and clap. Do that. <laughs> thank you. Um, I put the link for Henri's book in the chat. So if you'd like to pick up a copy of Blizzard right now, um, if you click on that, it's through Bookshop. So you're actually supporting an independent uh, bookstore when you purchase through Bookshop as opposed to Amazon. Um, where you're supporting Amazon. Oh, I was really upset because did any of you see the, the article this morning about Hachette being the like, because I, I supported Hachette so strongly in their fight with Amazon and now Hachette is publishing all of the um, right wing people, but they're gonna stop. Anyway, um, okay, yes. And so we're taking a break. Your break has begun. You should you know take some time, go to the bathroom, get yourself a drink, refresh your drink. Um, we are not in KGB, as you have noticed, and we have two ways for you to support, oops, sorry, um, I think that was the wrong one. Um, we have two ways for you to support um, the KGB bar. Are you seeing my, I'm sorry, there, are you seeing the Venmo code? You need to scroll. Um, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, there we go. Were, were, you, were, were you seeing this before or were you seeing my reports from Warren Wilson? I only no, saw I... this. <laughs> okay, good. All right. No. It looked it looked on my screen like you were reading student <laughs> evaluations of my teaching. No, no, no. I glad you're not. They were lovely, but still, it's just a little embarrassing. So, if you would like to support um, KGB, just kind of with a general, you know, whatever you would have spent on a drink tonight, um, you can use Venmo and you can directly um, make a contribution. Or if you would, and I'll I'll give you in the um, chat will give you the, the Venmo code if you prefer Venmo. Um, or you can go to, wait, sorry, I'm having a hard, for some reason my screen sharing skills are not doing very well tonight. Um, or you can go to the Fundly website and John has put that in the chat um, as well. And with this, you have something waiting for you at the end. So with the Venmo, you're saying, we love you. Here's what I would have spent tonight. Please enjoy. Um, with the Fundly, you choose, oh, Tom Slay just came. Hi, Tom. Um, you choose a giving level and you have prizes. It's like, it's like, you know, when you give to PBS and they send you the Doctor Who mug or the, you know, all things considered tote. Um, so for $15. The $50,000 bar tab. Well, well, we'll get there. We have a, yeah, we'll, we'll get to the $50,000 bar tab. So for, for $15, you will have two drinks waiting for you. So if you're worried about where your drinks are coming from when we're all vaccinated and we have herd immunity, we can go back out in public. Um, this is a great way to have two drinks waiting for you. And your tip has already been given to the bartenders. Um, and of course these go up through various different um, levels. Of course, our favorite is $50,000. So if you would like to tonight liquidate your retirement accounts <laughs> and support KGB at the $50,000 level, um, you will have a $45,000 bar tab. So it pays for itself. Though. It pays for itself. I mean, really, like you can only deduct 5,000 of it on your taxes because the other $45,000 you're going to drink um, <laughs> or you're going to share with us because I don't think any one liver can handle a $45,000 bar tap. That's just too much for one human person's <laughs> liver. That's like a lifetime supply. So we, we, we hope you'll, you'll if, you, if you can give it, a, you know, and, and there are options all the way between 15 and, and um, 50,000. So we hope you, we hope you'll pick the level that's right for you. Um, I do want to remind you that if you want to sign up for the open mic, um, that'll be March 8th, uh, Monday, March 8th at 7 p.m. So just message me um, in the uh, comments. Uh, you can message me privately 
And uh, just give me your name and your email and we'll sign you up. And um, John, Jada, Matt, am I missing anything? I no. So. Can, can you show us again how to how to um, contribute something? Can sure. You, yeah. You the Venmo. I don't. I don't understand Venmo, but that's that's all right. The, um, what was the second way? The second way, and you have a link to it in the chat. But if you Google um, Fundly and KGB, that will get you to the um, page where you can make the donation. Okay. Go Google Fundly, <coughs> Fundly, and, and KGB. Okay. Yes, and, and fortunately, there's the Soviet Union has fallen. You will not accidentally support the real KGB. Yeah, good. Um, although <laughs> they are, um, they they have reformed. Um, they are they are now called the FSB, the Federal Nayasluzhna Biasapasna, which means the Federal Safety Service. Um, and they had names before KGB, and they'll have names after the FSB. Yeah, if anybody didn't know this, he actually was not allowed to call it KGB bar because of the association. Um, the city wouldn't let him call the bar that. And so he filed everything under the name kind of good bar and then just called it KGB bar. It's like KFC. Yeah. It doesn't stand for anything anymore. I, uh, I don't know if you even know this, Jason or John, but uh, I manage the Facebook friends group for KGB. And uh, and I get a lot of uh, you know requests to join the group from uh, I, I don't know if they're robots but they're definitely Russian um, language robots and uh, so I don't know I I think that uh, you know there are some some stars in the sky that have their eyes on us <laughs> if you will well I I do have a huge collection of not a huge collection but I have a sufficiently large collection of Soviet kitsch that when we are back in the bar, um, everyone who reads gets a souvenir. So if you remind me, readers, um, Henri, Vijay, um, I will send you um, your, your Soviet kitsch souvenir for your KGB reading, but th Thank it's you. all in my office and I can't get into my office because of you know death and disease and pestilence. <laughs> You guys are funny to listen to. <laughs> it's such a such a contrast to quiet all day, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you should come and visit us again. We're 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 starting to get a little bit of an online community, I think, going here on Monday nights. I and will. I mean, will. There's we have like some online locals, you know what I mean? Which is great. It's almost begun to seem like Don Yordi lives in this room. <laughs> That's my only experience of him lately. And, and I tell you, I think that you inhabit it quite well, Don. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure what it all means, but thank you. Henri, please come back. I really enjoyed what you read tonight. And uh, it was wonderful uh, discovering you. So uh, there's a lot I don't know in the world and now. I know you, but you, you really should come back to the Monday nights at KGB. Thank you, yeah. Well, I'm not going, I'm gonna to listen to VJ. I'm talking about next next week. Yeah. Next, um, Henri said at the beginning that one of his fears was that he would become irre uh, uh, irrelevant. And I think that uh, in fact, he is probably most relevant important poet that we have right now. He is he is doing oh. what is really relevant. So you've gone, um, instead of um, off into the atmosphere, Henri, you have come right up to a place that we all really need to be. Mm -hmm. And I think I've got all the books right up here behind me. I've got the whole, so I've been watching you from the beginning, but- um, Thank you, Mary Stewart. What's, what you're doing is really important and very relevant. Thank you. Thank you. I teach on Monday and Wednesday nights. My students are three hours behind me in California, but our class starts at 7.15, so I, or East Coast time. So I'm, I'm sorry that it conflicts with your, with your program. But well, I, we I think should... we're gonna get into the second half of the program now. Sure. Um, Don, thank you for putting a link into um, the chat for your event. Um, if you do want to promote other 
poetry events, please feel free to put them in the chat. I know Rosanna Warren is doing something on the sonnet that I'm pretty sure I'm going to on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, and we have so many fantastic people in the room. I know you're doing excited things. So don't be shy. Um, feel free to promote yourself in the chat. And John. <laughs> Hello to that, Rosanna too. We also love it when people uh, sometimes just, if you hear a line that you really like to just throw it in there too, sometimes that's sort of fun. Um, the, the sort of shared love. And then, yeah, to Henri's point, you know, we, you're, uh, you know, the mark on our generation is absolutely firmly established. I can't speak for the many who are now younger than us, but I assume that your students are in that uh, range and that it's, it's, it's finding its way. We, we love your work and we love that you, uh, you are here. Um, same thing with Vijay Sasadri and uh, a short, just a short introduction for him. I thought Matt said some really nice things before, but um, one of my favorite poets and, you know, the wide universe and Vijay's poems uh, can be indifferent and remorseless, but also personal, intimate and accommodating. He navigates such contradiction with a monstrous intellect, abiding humanism, and striking ability to access what John Ashbery calls, quote, the otherness that gets included in the most ordinary forms of daily activity. That is the part of life that is the waking dream that can't be resolved and so that we must distract ourselves from if we have any hope of making sense of a given day. His poems remind us there is terror there, but perhaps peace in equal measure, mystery made beautiful. The voice in his poems feels like real speech, a frank conversation had over a drink with someone suddenly capable of contextualizing eternal mysteries by assimilating them with us. His pragmatic, a kind of rational mystic, and his wisdom that does not compromise or smile for the cameras. The poet treats his reader with dignity and respects their intelligence, and through his work we access renewed waves of clarity and peace. Vijay Sasadri was born in Bangalore, India in 1954 and came to America at the age of five. He grew up in Columbus, where his father taught chemistry at Ohio State. His poetry collections include three sections, which won the Pulitzer Prize, The Long Meadow, which won the James Laughlin Award, and Wild Kingdom. He currently teaches poetry and nonfiction writing at Sarah Lawrence, where he has held the Michelle Tulela Myers chair. He lives in Brooklyn with his wife and son. Here's Vijay Sasadri, KGB podium, digital podium. Thank you very much for that. That's really great. This is the first time I've had two introductions. I think, yeah. And uh, I hope both of them were recorded. Um, it's great to be here with Henri, you know, like Mary Stewart, I've been reading him from the beginning of his career. And, uh, and I don't know if I have all of the books, but I'm pretty sure I have most of them, uh, most all of them. And, uh, and I think he's one of those poets who I always, you know, whenever I feel like I'm sort of stuck or losing connection with my own voice, I go and listen to him by reading his poems because uh, he's got a wonderful sense of imaginative design. And also the microtones are so solid and fleshed out, you know, everything that's happening on the microscopic level of the poem is so well developed and articulated and uh, and it's extremely useful for me to be able to look at that and sort of orient myself in relationship to it. And there are only a few other poets and that uh, helped me in that way. So uh, it's an honor to be with him again. Uh, as far as Zoom goes, Jason, have you, do you, have you enabled my share screen? Yes, but okay. it enables everyone's share screen. So everyone be careful. We've had accidental share screens. Okay. Don't, don't be that person, only, okay. only for Jay. Okay, be careful everyone. Disasters have occurred. Careers have been ended because of this feature of Zoom. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, I took seriously the McLuhan notion that the medium is the message when I started using Zoom. So uh, I use this share screen feature whenever I give readings now. And it's a relief to me because I can put my poems up and not have to think that people are looking at my face. I'd rather have them look at my poems. And uh, so I'm going to share my screen 
and uh, and I'm gonna do a little fudging probably, and I might mess up, so you might lose me, but uh, I'm always here. Uh, and uh, and I'm gonna read this way, and I will start out by reading my bear poem that was in the email because Henri started out with his. If I can find it. Yes. Okay. And uh, it's called The Estuary. The brown bear living near the estuary and wading out when the tide swells in the salmon run during the days of the dwindling salmon runs and slapping with his big right paw a hook-nosed fish, whipsawing inland to spawn. The ambidextrous bear, furred like the forest from which he emerged, waddling into the unteachable waters to swat the salmon out the fast running tide and catch the red salmon in his mouth and toss and juggle the sockeye salmon, thrashing and drowning in the air. And when he's expressed himself completely, he catches with his jaw the self that swam 10,000 miles to the estuary and daintily, mincingly, with one paw grasping the caudal fin and the other the head, eats that salmon as if he were we and the fish in ear of boiled corn. That bear is a bear about whom rich and complicated feelings can be felt. That is a bear from whom ideas about the state of nature can be derived. Cruelty is the wrong word to describe the pleasure he gets from playing with his lunch. Play and life are the same thing to him. Art and life, life and death. Creation impinging on a consciousness, clear and crystalline. Pinpoint revelatory explosions, unsoiled by words, unbesmirched creation clambering out of the waters, shaking itself off, creation surrounding itself with itself, stay down on the pavement where you just fell in a heap like a bag of laundry, just stay there, move even a little and you might damage something else. You've already done plenty of damage. Stay down, supine, stay down and let the giant buildings loom over you let them in their abstract imperium stun you with their indifference. Wasn't that the reason you built them in the first place? Stay down, stay down and ask yourself, could I be the bear in this fable? Could I be the fish? Could I be whoever is imagining all this? Don't. I think sticking with Henri, I'll go to the Goya poem. I can find it here. Oh. The Goya poem is the only poem I've ever written about a work of art, even though I'm a habitual looker at artwork. I've never really uh, been attracted to acrostic poems. But this Goya image is one that has always disturbed me. And I'll show you the image as soon as I find the poem. Yes. Um, I'm going to stop the share and then I'm going to show you the image. Let's share screen again. This, as you all probably know, is one of the black paintings. Uh, they're in the, the, a room of their own in the Prado because uh, no other paintings can abide to be with them. And there are some significantly more dramatic images and terrifying images, but this has been the most disturbing one for me in the many, many years that I've known it. And uh, and so eventually I knew I would have to write a poem about it. And eventually I did. And this is the poem. Can everyone see the poem? 
You can? Okay. Okay. Yes. Goya's mired men fighting with cudgels. The violence done to the mind by the weaponized word or image is bad. We can live with it though. We can understand it or we can try and we can consider ourselves lucky, which we are. Nothing can be understood about the blunt force trauma to the head, the percussion grenade, the helmet to helmet hit at an aggregate speed of 40 miles an hour. No concussion protocol comprehends the self's delicate apparatus crumpled in the wide pan of the brain, the roof collapsing in Aleppo, the beam slamming the frontal lobe, the drone, the terror by night and day. He wanted to remember it all, to fix the image cradled inside the image of itself, 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 down the facing mirrors of future and past. And then he wanted to be left to die there in the ditch where he was cudgeled down and under, groundwater seeping into his mouth, himself becoming groundwater. But he felt a hand reach down and grab him by the collar and yank him back up and set him on his feet. And as he steadied himself, he thought, this compassion he feels for me is his mirror enemy, image, brother in wrath, and that I feel for him. This compassion is the compassion that those who see themselves in agony feel. But there is the other compassion, the one felt by those who see agony in themselves, which the deaf master will feel when he imagines us poised and ready to recapitulate our thinking's frozen violence. The great deaf master living in the villa of the deaf where he will paint us in silent pastels. Vijay, we're actually looking at the painting, not the uh, oh. poems. I'm sorry, that's my fault. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm going I have to stop share, but Okay. Now are you looking at the oh, okay. Sorry. I always get this wrong. I don't know why. I mean, I've done it enough times, but uh Okay, now can you see the poems? Yeah, now we're looking at the poem again. Okay. We're seeing Night City. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'll just, uh, okay, since I'll continue in that vein and just read two more after this in a different vein. Night City. This is, uh, A uh, poem about what's happening, what what was happening in the borders at the borders of this country, which uh, hopefully is now going to recede into the past. Night City. What happened to the city that made us promises, promises we had the luxury to believe or not? Night caved its streets, collapsed its buildings, and crushed its ten million screens. And now from the crushed screens, the flat translucent images extrude themselves, escape and flow flat over the rubble. Flat images desperate to become round, flailing across the river from one dimension to the next. Brutalized children, drowned fathers, drowning in the river and then in the eye and then in the mind. Flat images stealing quietly over the rubble flowing under the cracked sills and over the broken stairs and into the city's caved beds to wrap around the sleepers like cellophane, wrapping the complicated sleepers in simple suffering, the sleepers huddling in their dreams, muffled by their longings, their ears muffled, while mobs with torches rage on the rubble.
and go. Then no. Uh, I'll read the poem the forest wanted me to read visiting San Francisco. And then uh, the poem for, you know, I'll end with a poem for the new administration. These are all from my new book, by the way. This is called Visiting San Francisco. I wanted to curl up in the comfortable cosmic melancholy of my past, in the sadness of my past being past. I wanted to tour the museum of my antiquities and look at the sarcophagi there. I wanted to wallow like a water buffalo in the cool, sagacious mud of my past. So I wrote you and said I'd be in town and could we meet? But you think my past is your present. You wouldn't relent. You wouldn't agree to dinner or a cup of coffee or even a bag of peanuts on a bench in North Beach. You didn't want to curl up or tour or wallow with me. You're still mad long after the days have turned into decades about the ways I let you down, the 400,000 ways. Maybe I would be too, but people have done worse to me. I don't think I'm being grotesque when I tell you I've been flayed and slayed and force-fed anguish. I've been a human cataract plunging through a noose and going to pieces on the rocks. I've been a seagull tethered to Alcatraz. What can I say? What more can I say? How much more vulnerable can I be to persuade you now that I've persuaded myself? Why can't you just let it go? Well, at least I'm in San Francisco. San Francisco where the homeless are most at home crouching over their tucker bags under your pollarded trees because your beauty is as free to them as to the domiciled in their deadbolt domiciles. Your beauty is as free to the innocent as to the guilty. The fog is burned off in a cheap and windy room on Russian Hill. A man on the run unwraps the bandages swaddling his new face, his reconstructed face and looks in the mirror and sees the face of Humphrey Bogart. Only here could such a thing happen. It was really always you, San Francisco. Time won't ever darken my love for you, San Francisco. And then I'll end with the second poem in the book. Uh, this is a kind of poem that derives from my long history in New York. I came here in 1982 and I immediately registered to vote that uh, election cycle. And when you register to vote, you eventually in the precinct in which you've registered, uh, you're vulnerable to being called to jury duty. And soon afterwards, I was called to jury duty. I was living in Manhattan then. and. Uh, and I went down, I showed up and uh, I wasn't picked for a jury. I wasn't even picked for the war deer. And so I felt like I dodged a bullet. And I was still living in Manhattan three or four years later when it happened again. And again, I wasn't picked. And again, I felt I was lucky. And then I moved to Brooklyn. And after a few years in Brooklyn, I got called again, this time to the courthouse on Adams Street and uh, again, I wasn't picked. And again, I didn't make it to the bar deer. And uh, this kept happening. This is over the course of, uh, you know, basically 30 or so years. And, uh, and I started wondering what was going on. First, I thought, well, it's because I'm a person of color that they're not picking me, but it, that couldn't have been true because there were people of color who were being chosen. And then after a while I thought, well, it's because I'm an Indian. 
But then it looked like there were South Asian looking people who were being, you know, at least ushered into the voir dire. And so finally I did accept the fact that it was me, they didn't want me. And uh, the last time it happened, I finally made it to the voir dire, which is the little group, you know, a few people get chosen and they go and then the lawyers come and look at you. You know, it's sort of like a state fair where you're being judged by, you know, your, your cattle or you're like pigs who are being judged for, you know, their exquisite piggishness or whatever. And, uh, and they turned me away from the voir dire too. So out of frustration, this time, by this time, I really wanted to be on a jury just because I felt like I was being excluded. So in frustration, I wrote this poem. Commas, dashes, ellipses, full stops, question marks. People restless on the pews downtown. People not of the book or of the book, itchy and introspective in the big cross section of humanity room in the courthouse on Adams Street. Apothecaries, scriveners, gendarmes, recidivists. 60% are happy 65% of the time. 30% are okay 79% of the time. One is angry. That's what the bulletins from the ether say. And maybe we'll do something about it, but not today. Today is another day. Today is the day the self's whispering to itself and its hundred endangered languages merges with the sound of water running and scoring grooves in the damp, lithic, adhesive interiors. The limestone cavern of being where flying mammals hang and nurse their young and contemplate upside down the inscaped person waiting to be called out of himself into the light of reason, to be impaneled on a jury here, right here in Brooklyn, so he can judge lest he not be judged, but forgiven, just forgiven. Grace, with no instinct to explain itself, pouring out of every portal. Are you blind that you can't see it? I am, I guess I am. Communion, submission, detachment. And what would I rather be doing than sitting here pretending not to look at the rest of you of the city and of the world? So compelling is your exhausted, disillusioned but steadfast commitment to the mechanisms of justice, the apparatus of democracy. 12 good persons and true will be summoned from the cardinal points to, but not me, I guess. The bailiff is saying, go home, not you, not today. For the hundredth time, I have been called but not chosen. For the hundredth time, I have to shuffle into the subway station at J Street where a tall, sweet looking, willowy violinist is playing the chacon with apocalyptic focus and the ghost of a smile on her lips. Maybe she will say yes to me. Maybe I can stay with her always. Maybe I can sleep on my hands at her little desk. I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd rather go blind than to walk away from you, child. Great, thank you. Let me unmute every, let me give you the power to unmute yourself. Yes, you can unmute yourself now. Yeah. Hey. Um, so we will, we're not done. Um, I mean, you, you, I'm, I'm going to stop recording. Mm. Um,